What do we know about explosions? They're chaotic. They're unpredictable. Many years ago, at our home, we were collecting a bunch of dead limbs and dead trees to burn and get rid of. And there was a, it had to be a pile about 15 feet high. And just the way our kids intentionally or not put this together, there was like a hole in the middle. It was almost like an igloo. Now, let me say for this moment, I wasn't present for any of this. They took two gallons of gasoline and poured it on top of this pile of wood. And then my one son, I'm not sure if he's here this morning, had the bright idea of walking into this pile, in this igloo, and lighting a match. Well, yes, <laughs> as you can imagine, it exploded. And for many, many months thereafter, our son had no hair on his arms, his legs, or his head. And even to today, his hair is still short. <laughs> That's the nature of explosions. They're unpredictable. They're chaotic. And that leads us actually to the next argument for the existence of God. And that's what's called the teleological argument. Now, that's a big word, but it's an argument that comes from design. The word telos is, is from the Greek, and it has the idea of, of something that has a meaning or an end or a purpose. And so teleology is, is the study of the evidence of design or purpose in the universe. The teleological argument for God is based on the fact that when this universe that apparently exploded into being, it did so with the appearance of design and with purpose. But wait, that isn't how explosions normally proceed, is it? It almost seems that when this universe came into being, that it was designed for life, that it was designed for you and me. It would appear that this universe has life-permitting properties. And this, this has been given a name. It's called the anthropic principle. This is a principle that we see when we examine our universe. The idea is, and the, that word anthropic means human or man. And the anthropic principle recognizes that the universe appears fine-tuned and designed to support life. Some refer to this fitness of the universe for life as the Goldilocks factor. You remember the story of Goldilocks, right? She, she goes into the, what was it, the bear's home and... You know, mama bear's soup was too cold, papa bear's was too warm, but baby bear's was just right. Mama bear's bed was too soft, papa bear's bed was too hard, baby bear's bed was just right. Well, what scientists have concluded when they, when they look and gaze in the stars and study it is that our universe is just right to allow for the existence of life. And this comes as a surprise to them. They can't explain it, because if we just came about as a result of this explosion, explosions are not organized. They're not designed. And so this is what gives us the grounds for developing this teleological argument for God's existence. And it's very simple. Every design has a designer. The universe shows evidence for a high level of design. Therefore, the universe had a designer. And we would argue that that points to the existence of God. So let's take a look at these for a moment. Every design has a designer. This is pretty much self-evident. You know, if, if you were to, to go in your woods and you were to find this object laying there, you would not conclude that it just happened to be there by chance. And recognizing and appreciating the high level of design and complexity, you would conclude that that watch must have been designed. Hopefully you would conclude as well that it belonged to me and you would give it to me at some point. 
But something when you see high complexity, high design, it speaks to intelligent causes. So what about the universe? The universe is infinitely more complex than a Rolex watch, as we're going to see in just a moment. And the recognition of this, the recognition by scientists, when they gaze into the heavens and saw the design, they knew that it pointed to an intelligence. And that's why we find that the vast, vast majority of the early scientists were all believers. They were not secularists. They were not naturalists. They saw that intelligence, that design in the universe, and they knew that had to point to a designer, the God of the Bible. So a couple examples. Here we have the Grand Canyon. We don't see much design there, do we? But how about when we go to Mount Rushmore? There we see a difference, do we not? We see design, and that design speaks to intelligent causes. And so we have two types of causes, intelligent causes and natural causes, Mount Rushmore and the Grand Canyon. Let me give you another example. Here we have simple beach sand. Again, what does it point to? Natural or intelligent causes? Natural, right. <coughs> now how about Jesus sand? What does that point to? Something like this does not just happen. So again, two types of causes, intelligent and natural. One more. Here are the mountains of <laughs> of Peru. Again, as we look at these mountains, we don't uh, see any uh, specific evidence of intelligence here. But if you go to Machu Picchu, there now you see design, and design speaks to intelligence. I, I include this slide because I was doing a, a class like this in, in Peru in 2020, and part of my agenda was at the end of the class I was going to visit Machu Picchu, and then of course the pandemic hit. And uh, I received a phone call that I had to get home right away, and I got the next plane, and the very next day, Peru closed down. So I thank the Lord I got home, but I really wish I had gotten to see Machu Picchu, maybe, maybe someday in the future. But that's the idea. Every design has a designer, speaks to a designer. But now what about the universe? Does the universe show evidence for a high level of design? Again, I would argue that it does. When we gaze up into the skies and we see the beauty that's there, we might ask, well, where is that evidence of design? Now, the answer to that question is as much what we can't see as what we can see. And again, as time permits, I want to give you just a few examples to show you and demonstrate the evidence of design that's implanted within our universe. So let me start by sharing with you some of the unseen evidences of design that we find in this universe of ours. Research has revealed that there are certain physical factors, or what are called constants, that exist within our universe. And these constants are incredibly precise. And without them being exactly what they are, not only could we not exist, but our universe could not exist. And each one of these constants are interdependent, which means if you change one constant here, it affects another constant over here. Back in the early 1900s, the thought was that maybe there were a dozen of these constants. Today, we know that there's over a hundred of them that exist when we refer to them as fundamental physical constants, what we're saying is they're both universal in nature and constant in time. So whether you're at one end of the universe or all the way at the other end of the universe, that constant will still be the same. It doesn't change from one end of the universe to the other. And whether you're looking at this moment in time today or you're looking at the very beginning of our universe, these constants have been present and unchanged throughout time. So what are these physical constants? Let me, again, just give you a couple examples. First, let me just 
remind you or introduce you to the four fundamental forces of nature. These are the four forces that explain everything that takes place in our universe as far as the forces that govern what happens. The electromagnetic force is that force that helps keep atoms and molecules together. The um, weak force is, is responsible for radioactive decay. When one... Oh, yeah, I guess I should, that would help, wouldn't it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the, um, the weak force is responsible for a form of radioactivity. When one nuclear particle decays into another, that's the action of the weak force. The strong force is that force that holds the nucleus together. And gravity is that force of attraction between all the masses in the universe. Now, each one of these forces have their own physical constant. And electromagnetism has three. So let's look at one. All right, we'll take a look at gravity first. Right? That's something that we're, we're all familiar with. Gravity... Uh, went too far? Okay. All right, gravity is the fact that everything pulls on everything else. All right? As an example, we have the sun and the earth here. The sun is pulling on the earth. And the earth is pulling on the sun by virtue of gravity. It was Isaac Newton who discovered the equation that quantifies gravity. And let me explain this to you for a moment so you appreciate what we're talking about here. That the big F little g is the force of gravity. What is the force, if we use the example of the Earth and the Sun, what is the force that's present between the Earth and the Sun attracting one another? The two M's are the masses of the two objects, the mass of the Sun and the mass of the Earth. So the masses multiplied times each other. The R squared is the distance between these two objects squared. Now all of those numbers can change. They're all variables. Instead of the sun and the earth, maybe we're talking about this, the earth and Jupiter. And obviously the distance change. So all of these numbers change except for the big G up there. That's what we call the physical constant. Everything else changes, but that constant stays the same. So what is the physical constant for gravity? Look at that number, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th power. It's an incredibly small number. And that is a number that is fixed from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe throughout all time. Wherever there are two objects, that physical constant does not change. Well, how sensitive does that number need to be? Well, if that gravitational force were altered by more than one part in 10 to the 40th power, this is what we're talking about. Look how small a number that is. If it changed by just that small amount, not only would our universe well, our universe would cease to exist, and obviously we would cease to exist as well. That's the degree of precision of that physical constant, that that smaller number change would be enough for our universe to cease to exist. Now compare 10 to the 40, well, let me, I'm gonna actually pass over that one for the sake of time. Let me go to the weak nuclear force. If the weak force had varied by one part out of 10 to the hundredth power, it would have prevented a life-permitting universe. How, how big a, or how small a number is that? 
Well, the number of subatomic particles in the entire universe is only 10 to the 80th power. And we're talking about a change of 10 to the 100th. We're not talking about particles, subatomic particles. What makes up an atom? There aren't enough particles in the universe to cover that small fraction of change that would result in all of this taking place in our universe seek, ceasing to exist. None of these constants, and I say there's over 100 of them, none of these constants have any reason whatsoever to be what they are and not something else. And they say what's really spooky about it is a tiny change in most of these physical constants would make life in the universe itself impossible in which to live. But let's look at some things now that we actually can see. Let's take a look at our solar system. Here's our solar system. The relative sizes are accurate, what we see here, but not the distances, not the space between them. This is condensed so we can get this all on one slide. But notice, if you would, in particular, as we identify these uh, uh, planets, notice the size of Jupiter compared to the size of the Earth, and that's us right there, all right? Notice the size of Jupiter, how big it is compared to the Earth. Jupiter's gravitational field acts like a cosmic vacuum cleaner. And what it does, it pulls all the comets and all the asteroids that are entering into our solar system. And those plumes that you see are the sites where these comets and asteroids are hitting the planet. And those plumes are the size of our Earth or bigger. Jupiter just happens to be in just the perfect location and just the right size to protect the Earth from potential destruction. Just happens to be in the right location. Let's look at another example. The Earth spins at just over 1,000 miles per hour at the equator with a circumference of just over 24,000 miles. One rotation takes 24 hours. That's how we get a 24-hour day. But what if it took longer than 24 hours? What if the Earth turned at a little bit slower speed than it does? Well, then what does that mean? You're going to have a longer time in the day and a longer time at night. And we would have extremes of temperature that would be unsustainable for life. It's at the right speed so that those temperatures do not go to those extremes. What if the Earth revolved faster than it does? Well, then the wind velocities would be so high that once again we would not be able to live. Let's look at another example. All right. The Earth's rotational axis is 23.5 degrees. That's the tilt of the Earth. That's what gives us our seasons and our varying length of days. But if that tilt were, all, were altered only to a slight degree, again, it would be too extreme for life. From just these few examples, we see that the odds of our world just happening to be anthropic, life permitting, are very, very, very remote. Our universe clearly shows evidence of design. Even Richard Dawkins, the author of The God Delusion, makes this statement. He says, there is the appearance of design and it is overwhelming. And he even goes on to say, there's no explanation for it in physics. Duh. <laughs> but still, he denies the obvious that if there isn't an explanation in physics, if, there isn't an ex if it is overwhelming evidence, maybe indeed, if the universe had a, had a, uh, has design, that perhaps there's a designer behind all of this. 
Now, we, we've looked at just a couple examples of the complexity of the universe. I'd like to take a few minutes now to take a look at what actually makes life possible. What about life itself? You know, this is the, the so-called first simple cell, a single-celled organism. Charles Darwin, given the technology of his day back in the 1800s, believed that a simple cell was only a little blob of protoplasm and nothing more. And he envisioned this simple cell from just simply coming out of some warm little pond. That's where all of life began. But friends, we now know that life isn't so simple. And there are at least three issues that any worldview, whether it be an atheistic worldview, whether it be a, a theistic Christian worldview, there are at least three issues that any worldview must be able to answer concerning the origins of life. They are, number one, the initiation of life. Number two, the irreducible complexity of life. And number three, the information of life. And we're going to go over this quickly as, as time permits, but I'd like you to get a grasp and appreciation for the complexity of life. So we start with the initiation of life. Natural selection says that evolution favors one already existing organism over another. I rarely argue with an atheist over the subject of evolution. It's not because I believe evolution is correct. It's not believe, because I can't defend the Bible's account of the origin of life. The reason is it's unnecessary. If an atheist can't tell me where life began, how it, how it began, then we don't even need to get into that other discussion because they can't even get started. Evolution deals with existing life and how it changed. Well, first tell me how we got to life in the first place and then we can cover those other subjects. There are, and I'm just gonna list them here, but I, I'm not going to take the time to read them all. The, the, the point that I would just want you to understand is that there are many, many factors that would be necessary for life to originate on its own. An incredible number of factors and just let me just continue them here, just, just to list them for you. An incredible number of factors that it's virtually impossible when you look at all that's necessary for life to arise on its own. Now again, Richard Dawkins, the one who acknowledged that there's incredible design, in his book, The Selfish Gene, he kind of ponders, he's kind of talking out loud what, what his mind is thinking in his book, about how the first life might have formed on its own. And, and that's what we call abiogenesis, the origination of life without any outside help. And, and he admits that he has no answer for how life began. Now, his specialty is, in, is biology and zoology. He says, I don't know. There is no clear explanation. There's no clear pathway for how that has happened. But he offers an alternative because he realizes to suggest life began on its own is so, in, the obstacles are so incredible that he offers an alternative explanation, what's called panspermia. Anybody hear that term before or familiar with that term? The idea is that, well look, I can't explain how life began here on Earth, but maybe Life came from some other planet and seeded our Earth. Well, think about that. What you have there is an, an, an infinite regress, right? Well, if life came from somewhere else, where did that life come from, right? And then where did that life come from? But it shows 
the paucity of evidence that they have, even theories for the origin of life. That Richard Dawkins, the best explanation he can give is, well, I think maybe life came from somewhere else. It didn't originate here on earth because that just doesn't make any sense. So the initiation of life, we have to explain that. An atheist, a naturalist has to explain that. Let's take a look at the next part. The irreducible complexity of life. The idea here is that a, a single system which is composed of, of several multiple interacting parts, each part contributes to the basic function. So that if you lose or remove any one of those parts, the whole system essentially fails. I, I put up here just a, a mouse trap. There aren't too many pieces there to that mouse trap, are there? You've got the wood base, and you've got the spring, and you've got the cheese. But if you remove any one of those parts, the mouse trap becomes non-functional. Well, what about a cell? How complex is a cell compared to a simple mouse trap? We now know today that a single cell that you see here is far more complex than a nuclear submarine or a spaceship. All simple life is complex and integrated and certainly cannot come from non-life. I think a good analogy for a, a simple cell is a factory. In a factory, what do you have in a factory? Well, and what do you have in, 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 a, in a cell? Well, in a cell you have a nucleus, right? That's the headquarters of the factory where the managers will give instructions for the running of this factory. In that nucleus, you have the DNA and the chromosomes, which are the instructions for what's going to be constructed in this factory. You have what's called mitochondria. That's the, the power source. That's where the, the energy comes from to run the factory. You have what's called the endoplasmic reticulum. That's where these products are actually produced. You have what are called the Golgi apparatus. That's the sorting center in the factory, where the different things that are produced are sorted and, and put in different locations for further use. You have in a, in, a, in a simple cell, you have what are called vesicles, which is the transport mechanism to take what's produced here and bring it over here. You have the cell membrane, which is the fence that goes around the factory. That's there for protection and safety. And then you have what are called lysozymes, which is, is what gets rid of it. It's, it's where the, the waste is taken and disposed of. All of these things are in a simple cell. The thing that Darwin said just kind of crawled out of some warm pond. But there's something that a, a cell has to do that no factory can possibly do. And that is to reproduce the entire factory. A cell is an automated factory that's a thousand million times smaller than the smallest piece of machinery that's ever been created. And yet that incredible little factory is able to replicate its entire structure in a matter of hours whether that's a great redwood or whether it's the human brain. The late astronomer Fred Hoyle, oops, sorry, uh, said this when it came, came to you know, how this could happen. He said, um, imagining you know, a cell coming from nothing is like a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and being able to assemble a 747 from the materials therein. It's impossible. Any reasonable person would acknowledge it's impossible. The incredible complexity. So we have the initiation of life that we can't explain outside of a supernatural force. We have the, 
the uh, interdependency, that irreducible complexity. And then finally, we have what's called the information of life. It isn't just that life is incredibly complex. It isn't just that it's irreducibly complex, that you, if you remove just one part, that the whole system fails, that you need to have all these different parts all present at the same time in order for it to function. It isn't just that, but it's what some have termed specified complexity, that this, this complex cell contains information. And that information is found in what's called DNA. I, I, we have up here, this is just a, a um, let me back up a little bit. There's a, a water molecule, a hydrogen ion, uh, uh, atom and two oxygen atoms, all right? Just to give you an idea of, of what a molecule would look like. There, there's your water molecule. But we're not talking about water molecules here. We're talking about what are called polymers, where many of these molecules get together to form what are called biopolymers. And the ones we're talking about are <clears throat> deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Just for comparison, there's a strand of DNA. And that DNA, that complexity, is a specified complexity because that what you're seeing there contains information. It has the information to tell that cell, to tell that factory, these are the, these are the um, ingredients that you need. These are the amino acids that you need to create a protein. And this is the order in which you need to put those amino acids in order for that protein to be created. It contains intelligence. It contains information. Bill Gates, I think you're all familiar with, with uh, Mr. Gates. He made this comment. He said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created. How much more advanced? Well, if we put a computer chip up here, DNA has 45 trillion times more information storage capacity than our best computer chip. 45 trillion times more in that tiny, simple little cell. The first simple life we realize now is not so simple. It's incredibly complex. It's incredibly intricate in its design. And it contains specified complexity. It contains information for its own reproduction and the like. Francis Collins is the physician and geneticist who led the Human Genome Project. And he co is the co-mapper of human DNA. It was as a result of his work when he was in medical school and his encounter with life and death issues that led him to become a theist, to believe in God. And at one of his famous lectures, he put up this image of a beautiful stained glass window. And he pointed out that with one look, everyone would agree that such an intricately designed object was clearly made by an intelligent being. He then put up this object. This is a cross section of the DNA molecule. There was immediate hush in the audience. The similarities were striking and the implications equally so. 
clearly when we look at the complexity of life, we realize it speaks to an intelligent designer and an intelligent creator that we're not looking at something that could happen as a result of some random chaotic explosion. It points to the existence of God himself. As we look at the cell, there's an observation that we make, right? The cell doesn't say it's made by God or it's made by natural forces on it. That's something that we have to evaluate and determine for ourselves. What is the most reasonable explanation for the origin of life itself? Atheists must be able to support why it is more likely that life arose by natural forces. Theists must support why it is more likely that life itself arose by intelligent intervention. Friends, again, I would argue it's, it's self-evident that when you're looking at design, it speaks to an intelligent cause behind it. Clearly, that is the most reasonable explanation for the origin of life. So we come back to our argument. Every design has a designer. The universe shows evidence for a high level of design. And we just took a few minutes to look at some of these. But then the final point of this argument, therefore, the universe had a designer. And again, that designer points to God. For those of you who are in my class, two weeks ago, we looked at a video or a portion of a video of um, Christopher Hitchin, a, a world-renowned atheist in a debate that he was in with uh, John Lennox, uh, a very strident atheist who has no regard or had no regard, he has, he has since passed, no regard for religion or Christianity. He's the one who wrote the book, God is Not Great. And throughout that book, ridicules the God of the Bible. Someone caught him, and, and we're going to switch and show a video here, just a, a brief, brief clip for just a moment. Someone caught him in a video where he acknowledges what he thought was the most powerful argument for God. And I'd like you to watch this clip and, and maybe a couple conclusions or observations that we make from that. So are we able to show that video? All right. No. If not, I, I can read it. If at some point, Sophie, we all asked, well, which is the best argument you get against from the other side? And I think every one of us picks the fine tuning one. That's the, the, the most intriguing. The golden box. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine, the fine tuning that one degree, well, one degree, one hair different, nothing. But even though. It doesn't prove design, doesn't prove a designer, could all have happened without it, it. You have to spend time thinking about it, working on it. It's not a trivial. We all say that. And then at one point, I think this is not on camera, um, I said, if, um, if I could convert everyone into the world, not convert, if I could convince it to be a non believer. And I've, I've really done brilliantly. And there's only one left, one more, and then it'd be done. There'd be no more religion anymore. No more deism. Deism. I wouldn't do it. And Dawkins said, "What do you mean you wouldn't do it?" 
I said, I don't quite know why I would have it. It's not just as there would be nothing left to argue with and no one left to argue with. It's not just that. But there would be that. Somehow, I, if I could drive it out of the world, I wouldn't. And the incredulity with which he looked at me stays with me still. Yeah. <clears throat> a couple of interesting observations, isn't it? First of all, Mr. Hitchens acknowledges that for him and for that whole group, whether it be him or whether it be um, Richard Dawkins, uh, uh, it's, uh, Mr. Dennett, uh, you know, wh whichever these atheists are, this argument from design is one that they really struggle with. For, the, for some of the reasons I just shared with you. And what's interesting, if you read any of their works, and I, I encourage you to do so, they never touch this subject. They'll, they'll dismiss it, but they'll never touch the subject of, of design. Why is that? That they're afraid to go there. And then the other comment, just that he made at the end, I, I just wonder. Why, why would it be that if he could rid the world of religion, that was his goal, that is their goal. They don't wanna just have the freedom to express their beliefs, they want to rid the world of religion, it is evil. That if he had the opportunity to do so, he wouldn't. And I don't know what the answer is, but I just wonder, even within that fallen heart, that callous heart, was there still some spark of the truth of the gospel in our Lord? And even a man like Hitchens couldn't get to that point of envisioning a world without any religion or without God. I close with this picture here before you. The universe was fine-tuned for a purpose. And we're only here today because God created a universe that's inhabitable for you and me. In Romans 1, 19 and 20, We read, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. That phrase, the things that have been made, in Greek is just one word. Poema, and perhaps you may need to correct me on my pronunciation there. And it does simply mean something that is made. And in the context, something that's made by God. But you know, that word gives us the English word poem. Have you ever thought of the universe as God's poem? As his masterpiece that points humanity to him as a, an amazing design that's to draw our attention and worship to him. That same word is found in one other place in the Bible, in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, same word, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. As a new creation, skillfully 
and artfully created in Christ. Have you ever thought of your new life in Christ as God's work of art? You are beautiful. You are valuable. And you are an expression of the very inner being of the divine artist. You are custom designed, tailor made by the master's hand. Friends, our lives need to point to God just as strongly as the universe does. Is your life, is my life, an argument for God's existence? Job 26, 5 through 14, we find Job launching into a, a magnificent hymn to the power and the sovereignty of God that had now been revealed to him at this point. And the chapter concludes with one of the loftiest, maybe one of the most beautiful expressions in the entire Bible as it relates to what we've just talked about this morning. When Job gazed into the universe, when we gaze into the universe, when we gaze inside and look at life and all that's there, as Job contemplated and reflected on all these things, this is what he said. And he says, and these are but the outer fringe of his works. The outer fringe. You haven't seen anything yet. This whole universe, all of life, just the outer fringe of his works. He goes on, how faint the whisper we hear of him. How faint the whisper. All of this, all of this universe, all of this life that we see in this great planet is but a whisper of the power of our God. What an awesome God that we serve and we worship. Let us praise him. Let us worship him. And let us reflect him that each one of us and evidence of our great God. Thank you so much for your time. Amen. And you're dismissed. Thank you. Thank you.